Well, before we jump into Acts this morning, I need to have a word with you. You people are way too dependent on your uh, GPS devices. Last week, when I was talking about Paul's missionary journey, I had a map on the screen, and I repeatedly said that Paul was going north and trying to go east into Asia. (laughs) Dr. Tim Deal was the only one who corrected me this week. That would be west. Fortunately, I know how to, how to go west. Uh, many of you know that the last two weekends, I've driven an 875-mile round trip west for no reason. <laughs> I came home again yesterday, and just a few moments ago, I got word that Eliza Joy has finally made her appearance. Now, I'm not going to be calling her Eliza Joy. Dub Stanton, who's seated right back here, years ago in Mexico on a mission trip, nicknamed me Jefe. That's the Spanish word for boss man. My children thought that was kind of funny, so all my grandchildren call me Jefe. <laughs> but I realize now I'm not the boss. I'm going to be calling Eliza Joy Jefecita. <laughs> no, I don't have pictures. I don't have weight. I don't have anything. It just happens, so you ladies don't hound me today, okay? (laughs) All right, last week in the book of Acts, we looked at the first part of the second missionary journey. You remember that Paul went back um, to cover those churches where he went on the first journey to strengthen them. He worked helping to disciple those who had heard the gospel previously. Uh, We talked about disciples who make disciples. And, And I didn't say this last week, but that really begs a question for all of us Are you discipling or being discipled? Now, that's a lifelong process. I I was thrilled when Pastor Jason told me that several of our older men said, I need to be working with, I need to start a discipleship group for some younger men. We're all to continually be in the process of being discipled and of discipling others. Now, as we said, Paul was trying to go west into Asia Holy Spirit wouldn't let him go. He went northward and then tried to go into Bithynia, ended up in Troas. He had the vision of the calling to Macedonia. You remember they first went to Philippi. Uh, There was a group of ladies who prayed together down by the river. Paul and and, uh, Silas met them. Lydia, who was very influential, came to Christ. Then you remember, of course, the story of the Philippian jailer and all that happened there. And that just reminded us that in the midst of uh, of opposition, God is working. God is orchestrating what he wants to happen. He's, he's directing Paul's ministry. What did Paul do? Paul simply remained faithful to listen to obey. He continually spoke about Christ wherever he was, not worried about the consequences, always looking for opportunities, always looking for that someone else, someone else who still needed to hear the gospel. So this week we're going to look at the second half of the second journey. We'll be looking in chapters 17 and 18 of the book of Acts today. You'll see in chapter 17, three cities, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens, and the response of the people in those cities is not unlike the response of of people today. Chapter 17, let's look at verses 1 through 7 together. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous... And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Now, Paul and Silas evidently were hosted by Jason, possibly staying there in his house. That's why they went uh, to the house of Jason. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So from Philippi, they they go through uh, Amphipolis, Apollonia. They didn't stop and minister there, evidently. Um, They didn't stop in those cities. They didn't evangelize those cities. Why? Because they expected Philippi to carry the gospel to those other cities. Paul typically, as you look through the book of Acts, Paul typically went to the the larger cities 
did his work there and then expected those cities to become centers for getting the gospel out to the other parts and areas around them. What does that say to us? Well, that says that everyone has a responsibility. It's not just the apostles, not the pastors, teachers, whatever you want to call them, not just them, but everybody in every place that heard the gospel message had the responsibility of getting the message out. So what does Paul do? Of course, he gets to, to Thessalonica and he goes into the synagogue. That, that's his normal MO, right? Anywhere he goes, first he goes to the synagogue. Why? Because he knows that there are Jews there who are seeking truth. They're not satisfied with their religion as Jews. They're seeking truth. And they're also, in these different synagogues, Gentile god fears. Gentiles who have walked away from all the false gods of their culture. They haven't yet found the Messiah, but they've been hearing the truth. And so they're going to these synagogues and worshiping along with them. You know what Paul was doing? Paul, Paul was doing, in every city he went, he was doing the thing um, that was the simplest way to start the gospel message in that city. He was going where there was, if you will, low-hanging fruit or ripe fruit. He knew in those places there were people who had been hearing the truth and people who were ready to receive the message of the gospel. And as you think about that, we need to look and think uh, of people around us in our own lives who are ripe fruit. Well, who are they? Typically, they're people who are struggling people who are disillusioned. Maybe they've gone through some major health issue. Maybe they have a relationship issue or a family issue or a financial issue or a job issue. Those are the people that we need to be on the lookout for and always ready to speak the truth to because they're typically ready to hear the message of the gospel. And so I would challenge us as a body to pray um, that God would open our eyes that we would see more clearly spiritually of those who have need. Now, it says some in Thessalonica were persuaded and believed But of course, as we've seen in other cities, it says others of the Jews were jealous. So they formed this mob. They could not find Paul and Silas when they went to Jason's house. So they dragged Jason uh, before the authorities. And you notice the same thing that they were accused of in other cities is being said here. These men have turned the world upside down and they claim there's another King Jesus. Well, Jason had to post a bond. What that meant was Jason had to pay a, a fee. He had to pay a bond, a peace bond. And it was money that he had to put up that if Paul and Silas caused any more disturbance in the city, uh, that money would be forfeited. Now, it's interesting, Jason is mentioned nowhere else in the Bible. He's simply a faithful believer who who stood for the gospel. But it is a reminder to us that following Jesus could be costly. Not just for us, but even for the people around us, even for our family or for our close friends. It can be costly, and we need to consider that. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Paul by this point, you remember what he went through at Philippi with the Philippian jailer um, being thrown in jail. You remember what he's, we just read now that he's gone through in Thessalonica. If I'm Paul, I think I'm asking God, hey, did I understand the vision clearly? Are you sure that you called me to Macedonia? Because look at, look at all the trouble that has happened. But you know, opposition can be confirmation. When we're opposed for advancing the gospel, when we're opposed to living for the kingdom of God, that can be confirmation what we're doing is exactly what God would have us do. And I'll just tell you, if life's always easy for me, I have to question, if life's always easy, how much of a threat am I to Satan? If he's not coming against me and opposing me. Paul's sent away, you see in verses 10 through 13 of chapter 17, he's sent away to Berea. Again, he goes to the synagogue, and, and look at this. It says in the synagogue there, he finds Jews who are open to the message and who examine the scriptures daily. These people, unlike other places he had been, these people were honestly and and seriously seeking the truth. That's why he would go to the synagogues, but the Bereans, scripture says, were more noble than any others he had encountered. Why? Because they were examining the scripture. They would listen to what Paul said, and then after Paul had spoken the, the scriptures to them, they would, on their own, daily, go and examine the scriptures and make sure they were hearing the truth. You recognize we have a lot of alleged uh, preachers of the gospel, preachers of the truth, that people listen to without examining and hearing what they have to say and seeing if it's really true. I'll just name three of the the biggest ones in our day, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, and Joel Osteen. You know, the last time I said from this spot that Joel Osteen was a false preacher, I got accosted by a couple of people um, out in the lobbies they were leaving about what great words of encouragement he gives. 
Listen, Joel Osteen can encourage you straight into hell. We need to be careful what we listen to, and we need to be careful that whatever we hear proclaimed is the truth of the gospel, that we know how to examine Scripture make sure it's true. And listen, I'll tell you that about me too. You ought to go home every Sunday and go back to the text that I've just preached from and make sure that I've spoken the truth. We've got to examine the scriptures. We've got to make sure when someone purports to be giving us truth from God or truth from God's word that that's exactly what the word says. You know, people really don't want to search scripture today, especially people who've not yet come to faith in Christ. You ever tried to share the gospel with a lost person? When you try to start quoting scripture or sharing scripture with them, they don't want to hear that. They think the Bible's just a bunch of fables, just some, some stuff that men wrote down. You know why that is? When you come to the truth of the gospel, you understand the truth of the gospel, a response is required. When you come to the truth of the gospel and and you see what truth is, you have to acknowledge God is God. You have to acknowledge the lordship of Christ. And people don't want to do that. They want to keep living life the way they're living life. They don't want to be challenged and confronted. They searched the scriptures daily. Well, and then you see the same thing happens again, the same pattern the troublemakers from Thessalonica come over. Um, Paul is, is, again, run out of the city. Uh, look in chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. Paul's run out of the city. He's taken to Athens, and it says in verse 16 of, of chapter 17, Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Uh, Timothy and Silas have stayed back in Thessalonica. They're continuing to work there. Because Paul's the main problem, he's, been, he's out of the city, he's in Athens. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So Paul's in Athens. Athens, although at this point in history has become to decline, Athens is still one of the most celebrated cities in the world at this time. It's the home of literature and, and art, uh, has a renowned university. It's the, the philosophical and religious center of the world. Uh, Athens was one of the greatest cities at this time. You know, most Greek cities had a lot, of, uh, a lot of idols, a lot of altars to these pagan idols, a lot of shrines, a lot of temples, but Athens topped them all. Literally every, uh, every building in the city of Athens, even the government buildings, were, was a shrine to a god. In Athens, Athens was a home to every pagan god invented uh, at this point. So it was above and beyond all the others. It was also home to great philosophers. Uh, You've probably heard and and studied, at least in high school or college, Socrates and Plato, both from Athens. Uh, Epicurus and and Aristotle made Athens their uh, adopted home. And so Paul comes to this great city. Now remember, he's he's kind of on the run. He's kind of needing to lay low, kind of blend into the crowd. Uh, maybe get uh, a little rest. He's alone here, though, waiting for his companions, and Paul, Paul just can't help himself. He's not one to, to lay low. The city has an immediate impact on him. You see, it says that he's provoked in his spirit. Why? Because he sees incredible deception that's occurring in this city. He's seeing that, that in this city there are people who have been led far astray, and there are souls that are in need of the truth, in need of the gospel, and all they have is all these false gods. So he does what he normally does. He, he preaches in the synagogue. It also says that he reasoned in the marketplace. What well, was the marketplace? It was the center of activity where the Athenians were often gathered to do business. And so Paul uh, shared there as well. And what happened was Paul quickly got a reaction from the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Those were the two main groups in Athens, the two main philosophical groups. And let me just, I'm going to dumb it down a little bit, but for sake of time, let me explain. The Epicureans believe everything happened by chance. It's a very simplistic explanation, but everything happened by chance. No one was in charge. Uh, If there were deities, they were disconnected from humanity and, and really had no power. And they also believe when you die, that's it. There's no afterlife. Um, There's no eternity, there's no resurrection, and so the bottom line for the Epicureans is there's no consequence to how you live, so enjoy life to the fullest, and they live basically pretty incredibly immoral lives. The Stoics, on the other hand, believe that God is everything and God's in everything. He's in that rock, he's in that tree, he's in you, he's in me. God is in all things, but what happens in your life is determined by fate. You just have to get a grip and control your own life. There's no one out there to help you. 
And like the Epicureans, the Stoics believe that, that there is no future. And so they begin to hear what Paul is teaching. And if you glance down at verse 18, they use this word. They say, hey, what is this babbler trying to say? And the word babbler is an interesting Greek word. It, it literally means seed picker. So here's the picture. They're saying Paul's philosophy, Paul is like, like a bird that is in the marketplace and, and down in the gutter picking up crumbs and picking up scraps. Paul is like a bag lady who has just all this assorted junk in her basket. She's a scavenger. They're saying, look, Paul's philosophy is just a bunch of scraps and bits of ideas that he put together, and it's absolutely nonsense. And it's interesting when you think about their reaction to Paul and you think about people today who consider themselves philosophers or especially people today who are university professors who claim to be very wise, they think that those of us who proclaim the gospel are uneducated and foolish. It's foolishness. Well, Paul is then taken to the Oropagus. Where is that? That's a hill on the city where the Supreme Court met 30 members of this court. They took care of, of civil issues and, and criminal issues, and civil issues basically had to do with philosophy and religion. It was their job to protect the philosophy, protect the religion of the city of Athens from blasphemy. And so here's Paul promoting some new teaching without proper approval, and so they want to hear what he has to say. Now, the Epicureans and Stoics obviously already have disagreed, but others are curious. Look in chapter 17 and verse 21. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Isn't that interesting? All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing. Evidently, they didn't work. They didn't do anything meaningful. They just would gather around any time there was an opportunity to tell or hear something new. You know, the French philosopher Pascal said, in every man there's a God-shaped void. What he was saying is we were made by God to have, to have this void, literally this emptiness in us that can only be filled by God. And yet, what does man do? Man tries any number of things to fill that void. And that was true of the Athenians. All this philosophical, all this religious knowledge they had, all these gods that they had that they could worship in, in their city, literally hundreds of gods, and they're still looking. And anytime they hear some new philosophy or some new god, they just add that to what they already have. Why? Because they're looking for completion. They're looking for fulfillment. They can't find it in all these gods that they have. Nothing has satisfied. Why? Because only the gospel satisfies. The gospel is, is truth, and only the gospel can satisfy a person's soul, and that is still true today. People are looking at all these other things and trying to figure life out, but it's only the gospel. Paul says to them, look, I'm not here to introduce to you a new philosophy or vision. I'm here to introduce to you the one true God. Philosophers would tell us there are three great questions in life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Science tries to answer the question, where did I come from? Philosophy tries to answer the question, why am I here? But neither has a satisfactory answer to where am I going. You know that Christianity is the only philosophy that can answer all three questions satisfactorily. We know where we came from. If we know Christ, we know why we're here, and we certainly know where we're going. And so Paul, in trying to explain this to them, if you look, glance down in verses 24 through 28, Paul presents God as the creator. He, he's the one that they're missing. He's that unknown God that they don't know about. He's a creator, but he's not distant from creation. He's greater than creation, but he's not distant from creation. He's a knowable God. He's not an unknown God. As, as creator, he's not made by human hands, and he doesn't live in a temple made by human hands. Now, that particularly struck to the heart of their philosophy. He's not made by human hands. Every god they had, every idol they had was a human invention. He said God's not like that. He, he demonstrated that God is provider. He's good. He cares about his creation. He doesn't need anything from man, but he provides all that man needs. What does Paul say? He provides life and breath and everything. 
So God's a creator, he's a provider, he's also the ruler. God is over all. God is the only God of power. God is the only God as creator who has the right to be over creation. He's over all, but guess what? He's not distant from us. He's a God, Paul says, who is not far from us. He can be known by us. And God tells the Athenians also, besides being a provider and ruler, he's a gracious savior. Look what he says. He has been patient with man. He's been patient with our sin, patient with our ignorance. He's provided salvation. Now, he is going to judge. A time is coming when he will judge, but right now he's giving opportunity to repent. And so he shares this message with them of this God that they don't know but that can be known. And basically most of them laughed or mocked especially when Paul tried to explain the resurrection. There were some who were interested. There were a few who wanted to hear more, and there were actually a few who believed, very few, compared to everywhere else Paul had been. In fact, it's tempting to think that Paul's message here in Athens wasn't very successful, but if you look down in verse 34, we read that one of the converts was Dionysius, one of the 30 members of the court. So Paul's message got through to one of the 30 highly intelligent, skeptical, philosophical individuals, and that's significant, the ministry that he had there in Athens. Chapter 18, he moves on to, uh, to Corinth. There he meets two Jewish believers, Priscilla and Aquila, who are tent makers like Paul. You know, Paul paid his own way pretty much everywhere he went. You see from time to time he received offerings uh, from different churches, that had been established, those offerings went to ministry. Paul made sure he paid his own way so that no one could ever accuse him of profiting from the gospel. And so he works with Priscilla and Aquila. While he's there in Corinth, of course, he does what he has done. Everywhere else, he goes to the synagogue, he, he teaches. And Paul, although he's having some success, is still being uh, strongly opposed. And if you look down in uh, chapter 18, verses 8 through 11, God comes and gives Paul a direct word of encouragement. Chapter 18, verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. By the way, he lost his job at that point, okay? When he came to Christ, it cost him. He could no longer be the ruler of the synagogue. Many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Well, if you go on through chapter 18, you see eventually, because the Jews kept stirring up opposition and bringing trouble, eventually they bring Paul before the Roman administrator, Galileo. They charge Paul with breaking the Jewish law. He's a Roman. He says, that's not important to me. He dismisses the case. And so they beat up Sosthenes, the new synagogue ruler. They just had to have their vengeance on someone. Paul and Priscilla and Aquila uh, set out for Syria. This is the end of the journey. Paul's going to return to Antioch. He stops in, in Ephesus. They ask him to say. He promises, if God allows it, that he'll return to them. And again, as he's returning um, to Antioch and Syria, he, he strengthens those churches along the way. Um, that he had been a part of establishing. Well, what, what does all this say? We've, we've run through a lot of history this morning. What do we see here? What are some takeaways or what are some applications for us? Let me mention just a few to you this morning. First of all, we've already said that Paul uh, continually sees opposition to the ministry of the gospel. That, that should not be a surprise. Jesus had told the disciples that would happen. Anytime we're trying to serve the Lord, it, it's very likely opposition will come. And that could cause us to doubt. Now, it's good when opposition comes for us to go to the Lord and, and ask, have I, have I heard you clearly? Am I obeying what you said? But remember, opposition can also be confirmation that we're on the right course, and we shouldn't give up. The second thing, along with opposition, is what we mentioned with Jason, and that is that the gospel is costly. It's costly to us, but it's also costly to those around us. It's important that we count the cost not only to ourselves, but to our family, to those closest to us, it's important that we count the cost. Not that we would count the cost and say, well, I I don't feel like I can do that, but we count the cost and say, you know what, because of what Christ has done for me, it's worth every bit of the cost, and we're just aware of the cost that might come in advancing the gospel. The third thing I see in here for us today is is that just that idea of being on the lookout for the low-hanging fruit or, or the ripe fruit. It's tempting to think in, in our culture today that, 
that people in America basically have heard the gospel, people know the answers, they know the solutions. We need to look for those who are disillusioned. We need to look for those who are part of our life, whether it's in the workplace or neighborhood, even our own family, who are, are struggling and consider that they may be ripe for the gospel. Along with that, I think we need to recognize that until people find the truth, they're always going to be searching. There is a God-shaped void. Nothing else will fill that void in a person's life. And people who have not found the truth are going to be searching. Don't ever think, let's say you know someone at work or in your neighborhood that's of a different religion. Don't ever think, well, well, they have their own religion. They wouldn't be interested. No, if their religion is not saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to continue to search. They're going to continue to look for meaning. Well, let me wrap up with one final word of application. I want you to back up to chapter 17 with me for one final thought. In my mind, as I studied through chapter 17 and 18, this was the biggest point of application and, and, and challenge to me. Look in chapter 17 and verse 16. This is when Paul had first arrived at Athens. He's waiting on Timothy and Silas to join him. Chapter 17 and verse 16. While Paul was waiting in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, if you look at the word provoked in our, in our English dictionary, it means to anger, enrage, to exasperate, to stir up. In the Greek, it simply means to infuriate. But here's what I found interesting. The Greek word translated here provoked has as its root word sour wine. Now, I, I've never had sour wine, but I'm guessing that that word is used to indicate that Paul was so stirred up by what he sees in the city of Athens that he's sick to his stomach. Is he angry with the people? No. Paul's looking as he gets to Athens, he's looking at a city, he sees incredible lostness, emptiness, false religion, a city whose soul is given over to idols, He, he's angry and enraged and exasperated over the work of Satan and the foothold that Satan has in this city, and he's sick to his stomach over the condition of the people. And that reminded me of a passage in Matthew where Jesus is traveling about throughout the land. He's preaching and teaching in the synagogues. And in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds... He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And the word compassion is a totally different word, but it has a similar background. The word compassion, listen, means an intense feeling in the inner parts to be deeply moved and affected. And it literally means to be moved in the intestines or to be sick to your stomach. And as I looked at what Paul went through, the, the feelings he had in Athens, and thought, of, thought about how similar that was to what Jesus went through when he saw the people who didn't know him, didn't know Messiah, they were like sheep without a shepherd. It, it made me ask the question, what about me when I see the lostness of people around me? See, it's so easy to think, well, I, I, live, in, I live in America, I live in the South, I live in the Bible Belt. Everyone's heard the gospel, everyone's heard what they need to know. If, if they're doing something else, if they're involved in some other kind of religion, or they're, they've got all these idols in their life, there's nothing I can do about it. No. Paul went into the city and, and he was disturbed. He wasn't angry with the, the people. They were only doing what they had learned, what they had grown up doing in the city they lived in. He wasn't angry or disturbed with them, but literally he was sick to his stomach by the lostness he saw in that city. There's lostness in our city lostness in our neighborhoods. There's lostness all around this church. Every time I go to Walmart or to Kroger or to any restaurant, I'm all around lostness. Oh, it may not be as obvious as it was in Athens. There may not be shrines on every corner. There's a lot of shrines in the hearts of people that you and I encounter every day. A lot of idols that they worship. A lot of pagan gods that they follow after. Shouldn't it disturb us? Shouldn't we be concerned enough about those we live around that it disturbs us? Not just we think, oh, that's, that's a shame. They don't know Jesus. That's a shame. They don't, 
go to church. No, it should disturb us. If there are people without Christ that we live around. It doesn't matter what they look like on the outside. It doesn't matter how together they seem to be. It doesn't matter how apparently successful they seem to be apart from Christ. They will never have meaning. They will never have purpose. They will never find fulfillment. It's not going to come anywhere else. And most importantly, they will spend eternity separated from God. We were made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, to be with Him eternally, to always be in relationship with Him. They will never experience that. It's been eternity separated from Him. God help us be provoked at the lostness we see around us.